Take your Bible if you have it this morning and uh, Ephesians chapter 2 for our scripture reading this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. There's two verses I want to read this morning. And we'll read them in unison. Ephesians 2 and verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. And as our custom is, let's stand together for the reading of the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's read verse 8 and verse 9 together, <clears throat> if you would, please. Let's begin together on verse 8. Ready? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Lord, I'm praying that you will prepare our hearts, that each of us will be ready to receive the truth from your word today. Lord, thank you for the good singing this morning. Thank you for the good spirit that's in the room to today. Thank you for, again, Lord, for each one that's made their way here this morning. And Lord, again, I'm asking you to speak to our hearts as only you can. Lord, I pray you'll bless the special now. May we listen carefully to the words of the song. And Lord, may you speak to each of us as we listen carefully for your still small voice. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. There's a sweet and blessed story Of the Christ who came from glory Just to rescue me From sin and misery He in loving kindness sought me And from sin and shame hath brought me Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me Hallelujah, what a Savior Who can take a poor lost sinner Lift him from the miry clay and set him free I will ever tell the story Shouting glory, glory, glory Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me from the depths of sin and sadness to the heights of glory and true gladness, Jesus lifted me in mercy full and free. With his precious blood he bought me, when I knew him not, he sought me. And in love divine he ransomed me. Oh, hallelujah, what a savior who can take a poor lost sinner, lift him from the miry clay and set him free. I will ever tell the story, shouting glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. From the throne of heavenly glory, oh, the sweet and blessed story, Jesus came to lift the lost in sin and woe into liberty, all glorious trophies of his grace, victorious, evermore rejoicing here below. Oh, hallelujah, what a Savior! Who can take a poor lost sinner, lift him from the miry clay, and set him free? I will ever tell the story, shouting glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. Now, Heavenly Father, we bow in prayer this morning. Lord, I'm asking for your help as we come to the preaching of your word. Lord, I would ask you that you would help each one listening today to listen very carefully. Lord, we open up the Bible this morning that we believe not just to be the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be in truth 
the words of God. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would listen carefully as to what uh, you would want to say to each of us this morning. Help me as I bring the message. Help it to be clear. Lord, help it to be easily understood. Help me to say what I should say and leave unsaid what I don't need to say. <clears throat> and Lord, where what you'll do in the hearts of people this morning, I'll thank you in advance. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique just to Christianity. Give me just a little bit more, if you would, Dean. They began eliminating some possibilities. They asked whether it was the incarnation. The incarnation is God becoming flesh, uh, that God was in Christ as He was born. And other religions, they found, had different versions of their gods appearing in human form. Well, was it the resurrection? But yet they found that some of the other religion had accounts of their God supposedly coming back from the dead. The debate went on for some time when a man named C.S. Lewis walked into the room and asked, what's the commotion about? And the colleagues replied they were discussing Christianity's unique contribution to the world. And C.S. Lewis responded, he said, that's easy. And they looked at him, he said, it's grace. Grace. The notion that God would provide salvation and extend His love to you and me, no strings attached, free of charge, goes against everything that most human beings think is the right way to go. That's why most all religions want you to do something in order to earn God's salvation. The Buddhist will have an eightfold path. The Hindu will have the doctrine of karma. The Jews will have covenants and ceremonies and rituals. The Muslims have their code of law. Each of them trying to figure out a way to get God's approval. A way to let God allow you into His heaven. Only Christianity makes the love of God unconditional. Bono, is that how you say that? He's a lead singer for the, a band called U2. He said in an interview with BeliefNet.com, how do you know what it means? Never mind. He said, he said this, listen carefully. He said, the most powerful idea that's entered the world in the last few thousand years is the idea of grace. It's, it is the reason I would like to be a Christian. Isn't that amazing? Now, grace, of course, is something we're receiving that we don't deserve. You have to understand something. Number one, I want to share just a couple thoughts with you this morning. We can never do enough to earn salvation with God. We can never do enough to deserve salvation. In a 2001 article in Reader's Digest magazine, Muhammad Ali was asked what his faith meant to him. And here's what he said. It means a ticket to heaven. One day we're all going to die and God's going to judge us for our good and our bad deeds. If the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. If the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. Now, that's, that's what Muhammad Ali said. And the truth is, that's what a great many people believe. They believe that God's salvation is based on two giant scales. And I pile up all the good things I do on this side, and I get the bad things piled up on this side, and I, if I get more good than bad, I'm in. If I have more bad than good, then I'm out. And a lot of people have that idea that that's what, that's what gets you into heaven or not gets you into heaven. But I'll tell you, that may be what Muhammad Ali thought. It may be what some of you think this morning. But it is not what God teaches in the Bible. God teaches there's never enough good that we could ever do to get us into heaven.
to give us salvation. The verse we read this morning in Ephesians 5 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, in the Bible you have God's law. And the Bible says the only way that we could earn heaven would be to keep His law perfectly. Never mess up one time. Never offend in one point. Because here's the standard. The Bible says if you offend the law in one point, you're guilty of everything. You say, well, I, <laughs> no one could keep that standard. You're exactly right. Nobody can keep that standard. Nobody is good enough to go to heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short of keeping the entire law of God and keeping the whole commandments of God. The Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 19, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Everyone in this room this morning is a sinner, including the person you're listening to. We all have sinned, and, and we all are guilty before God. In fact, the fact is, I'm not going to come into condemnation if as a sinner I, was, I am already under condemnation. If you have your Bible, you have your Bible, would you look at John 3? John chapter 3. Most of you are familiar, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Now, most of you in the room would know John 3.16. Would you not? How many of you know John 3.16? Let me see your hand. Yeah, quite a few of you do. For God so loved the world that He gave His... That whosoever should not perish but have everlasting life. That's right. Now, uh, let's look at the next verse after that. Verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Now, why didn't Jesus come to condemn the world? Well, look at verse 18. He that believeth on Him, who's Him? Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is, what church? condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus didn't have to come to condemn the world because we're already condemned. We're already under judgment. Because Say, what must I do to die and go to hell? You know what you must do? Absolutely nothing. Just keep living the way you're living. Do nothing with Jesus Christ. Do nothing to ask Him to save you. Do nothing with your sin. And God says you're under condemnation. You'll have to die and be punished in hell. That isn't what God wanted. That's why He sent Jesus into the world. So you wouldn't have to be condemned and I wouldn't have to be condemned. So listen, we are under condemnation. If you're born into this world and you begin to live and you never do anything with Jesus Christ, you are condemned already. That's not what I said. It's what God said. It's what the Bible teaches. And so I understand something. I need to be saved. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. See, God came, God sent Jesus to be the Savior. In Christmas, in a few weeks, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If God sent a Savior, somebody needed to be saved. And that's you and me. If you say, ah, that's safe stuff. I don't need to be saved. Why did God send a Savior if you don't need to be saved? See, then you have a problem with God, don't you? And, and you understand if there's a problem between you and I take sides between your side and God's side, I'll take God's side. Okay, you wouldn't be offended by that, I don't think. But you better be on God's side. Amen? So, you understand, under condemnation, we can't do anything to earn salvation. We cannot do anything to merit our own salvation. And here's the second thing. Because Christ did everything. 
Christ did everything to provide salvation for us. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God commended, or He demonstrated His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mentioned earlier that none of us in this room are able to keep every law of God. We would fail at some point. We would fail at some point, and God says, if you miss one point, you're guilty of it all. There's only one person that ever kept every bit of the law. Never sinned. Never never messed up one time. Never, not only never did something he shouldn't have done, never thought something he shouldn't have thought. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. Jesus never had a foolish thought. Have you ever had a foolish thought? And you think, man, what did I think that for? That was, huh? God says that was sin. You know what? Jesus never, he was tempted, the Bible says, in all points like we are, yet without sin. He was perfect. He was absolutely sinless. The Bible says that those of us who are sinners were under condemnation. In Romans 6, it puts it this way the wages of sin is death, death is separation. The reason death is hard for us when we lose our loved ones is we're separated from them. We no longer can talk to them or communicate with them. So death is hard, but dear, God says if we continue in our sin, then what we deserve, the wages we get, will be separation from Him. And the way you're separated from God is in a place called hell. God says, I don't want you to be condemned to hell. So I sent Jesus, my Son, And He came into this world. So many people in in just a little over a month will celebrate what's called Christmas that is supposed to be about the birth of Christ. And so many will celebrate it and not give Jesus Christ one thought. Not really understand what, what it's all about. It's about Jesus coming into the world and God so loving you and me that He would send Jesus to live a perfect, sinless life. And yet go to the cross on Calvary and hang there and bleed and die. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus was not dying for His sins. He did not have any. Whose sins was Jesus dying for? Yeah, yours and mine. And that day on the cross, Jesus Christ looked up in heaven and He said, God, uh, punish me instead of stand slate long. He took every sin that I've ever committed and sins I haven't committed yet, but He knows I will. And He laid those sins on Himself and He said, God, punish me and not stand. He said, God, punish me and not Bob. He said, God, punish me and not put your name there. You see, Jesus was your substitute. He took your place. He took my place when He died on the cross. Jesus was our substitute. He died in our place. When He died in our place, He not only was our substitute, He was our justification. That's a big word. Justification, the Bible says, we're justified by faith in Christ. Justification means I'm, I'm made right in the sight of God. So how could I be right in the sight of God? You can only do it through what Jesus has done for you. He's justification. He's reconciliation. He's made us peace with God. That's how we're reconciled to God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, the Bible says. So we were made, brought back into relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ that I become part of God's family. There's a great verse in the book of Galatians that says that ye are all the children of God. How many ever heard that statement? Well, we're all God's children. But wait a minute, the verse doesn't end there. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So when do you become part of the children of God? You become part of the children of God when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you realize that salvation is not what I do, Salvation is in what Jesus has done. I tell people all the time, you can take all the religions of the world and you can put them under two headings. One says do. 
do this, do that, do this, do that. Everybody in every religion has a different set of do's. And the thing is, you don't know whether you've done enough until you die. And then you have to hope you did enough to make it. But the other heading is what God has. And you know what the other heading is? Done. D-O-N-E. It's nothing we do. It's what has been done for us by Jesus Christ when He died on the cross. The songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. And so, salvation was all taken care of by Jesus Christ. So, because of that, God says that salvation is a gift for us to receive. Not a reward for us to earn. Salvation is a gift for us to receive, not a reward for us to earn. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The symbol of Christianity is not scales. It's not scales. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where Jesus paid for your sins and for my sins. How do you receive the gift of salvation? Well, it's pretty simple. Somebody called it the ABCs of salvation. And, and A simply means you have to admit that you're a sinner who needs to be saved. I have to admit, I have to come to grips with the fact I'm sinning and the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Now, I don't know everybody in the room today. I know some of our folks in the room today. I don't know hardly any of the guests, hardly, except I've, talking to, I've spoken to a few of you. But I know something about every single person in this room. Can I tell you what I know about you? You're dying. Guess what? So am I. Say, oh, pastor, did, did you see the doctor this week? Did he give you some news? No, I didn't have to see the doctor. Say, how do you know you're dying? I read the Bible. And the truth is, the moment we're born, we're beginning to die. Now, we all try to push it out as far as we can, don't we? We all try to, hope, hopefully we'll, we'll live and we'll get to be 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. We'll push it out there as far as we can. But you know what? Eventually, if, if, if I don't die in some other way, I'm going to get sick or diseased and I'm going to die. The thing is, we do not know when that will happen. We, we like to think we're going to die of old age. But there were 26 people who were in church last Sunday in Sutherland, Texas who never thought that would be the last time they'd ever be in church. They got up and got dressed went to church not thinking, I, I won't even see another day. That was the day of their death. But they didn't know. I don't know. Uh, Brother Orville here comes every year. I think you might have been here all 11 years. I don't know. But there's no guarantee he'll be here next year. I guarantee you there's some people who've been here before on dinner day who aren't here this year because they're in eternity. Death came. We don't know. That's the thing. We don't know when death will come. It can come unexpectedly. But death will come to all of us. And then, it will not be the scales. It's going to be, what did you do with Jesus Christ? What did you do with my Son? Will you admit this morning that you're a sinner who needs a Savior? B. The B, A, B, C's of salvation. B is you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior you need. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, not just for the sins of the world. Somebody says, well, I believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. I'm glad. There are people in hell this morning who would tell you they believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. Because all you're doing when you believe that is you're believing a fact of history. Say, so what's salvation, Pastor? When you believe Jesus died for your sin. 
He paid for your sins on the cross. And you will believe in Him as your Savior. There's a great difference between believing Jesus Christ is the Savior and believing that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'll trust Him as my Savior. I will trust Him to forgive my sin, that I will receive His gift of eternal life. And then C, A, B, C, is by C means calling on Jesus and trusting Him alone for salvation. The Bible says in Romans 10.13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so it's calling, and, and that means I'm going to pray, and I'm going to call on the Lord. And I'm going to ask Him for the gift of eternal life. You understand, I don't work to get a gift. You're, you, uh, you, you receive a gift. It's your birthday. Okay? When it's, when it's Brother Wallace's birthday. This is Bob Wallace right here in the front row. When it's Brother Bob's birthday, his wife decides what he likes or what he would want to have and she's going to buy it for him. And so she gets in her car and goes through the traffic of Columbus, goes to a store, goes into the store and finds what it is she want, he wants or needs and then she stands in line and then she gets her money out and pays for it. And she drives back through the traffic and gets home and she may go inside and find some wrapping paper or a nice uh, bag to put it in and put a bow on it. And when it's his birthday, she sets it down in front of him and says, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And Bob Wallace says, All right, how much do I owe you for this? <laughs> huh? No, 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 he can't. You know why? She says, No, 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 it's already paid for. Huh? It's already been paid for. It's just a gift. And so what do you do when you get your gift? You just accept it. You open it up. It's yours. And you say, thank you. Thank you. Because you know, I can't pay for it. It's already been paid for. Well, God said His gift to us is eternal life. And yet, it's amazing, isn't it? How many people think they still must pay for it? Okay, I'll go to church every week. Okay, I'll get baptized. Okay, I'll try to live better. I'll, I'll, I better keep the Ten Commandments. Or whatever it is that people think they have to do. And they think they're going to earn a gift. You can't earn a gift. It's already been paid for. Well, if salvation is God's gift to us and someone already paid for it, who paid for it? Jesus Christ. The gift of God's eternal life through... Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is not through anything we do. It's through what Jesus Christ has done for you. And God says when you call on Him, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. He didn't say you might be saved. He didn't say you could hope to be saved. He says you shall be saved. And my friend, look at me, look at me. That's a guarantee. Not from me, but in writing from God. If you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, He'll give you His gift of eternal life, and you shall be saved. It's, you say, is, that, is it really that simple? That's hard sometimes for our humanness to accept, isn't it? Because we want to think we've got to do something to get it. But you can't do anything to get it. It's grace. God's undeserved favor to us. And you know, I understand receiving gifts. We all understand that. Isn't God good to get, make salvation and liken it to a gift so we'd all understand how that works? And the question this morning is this. Are you willing to call on the Lord Jesus and accept His gift of eternal life this morning? The good news is, He's listening. He's ready to say. If you have to do your part, and that is to call on Him and ask Him to be your Savior. It has nothing to do with your works. You know, it's, it's baptism. Sometimes people say, well, I've got to wash my sins away in the water. That's nowhere found in the Bible. Jesus takes your sin away. 
Baptism is obedience to the Lord after you receive Jesus as your Savior. It's just an outward symbol. I have a wedding ring on. That's just an outward symbol of, that I made a commitment to my wife. I said, I do. You say I do to Jesus, that's salvation. You get baptized, that's outwardly showing everybody that you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. You go into the water, you're saying, I believe Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again for me. And you're letting everybody out here, you're not ashamed of that decision. See, that's baptism. That's just obedience. See, you can, uh, you can put a, a wedding ring on a 12-year-old kid. Does that mean he's married? Huh. No, of course not. He's a 12-year-old kid with a wedding ring on. So I got baptized when I was a baby. Uh, but you hadn't believed in Jesus. So what did that mean? It means you were, a wet, you were a dry baby and then you were a wet baby. That's all that meant. You, it only takes on significance. That ring only takes on significance once you say, I do. And you make the commitment. Then it means something. Baptism means something after you've received Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I've accepted Jesus, but I've never been baptized. That's the next step of obedience God would have you to do, is to obey Him in baptism. And that is just, just outwardly showing, I believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for me. You can also say, I'm dying to an old life and rising to walk in a new life for Jesus Christ. You see, but it has nothing to do with you going to heaven or not. It has everything to do with your obedience to the Lord. If you're willing to receive God's gift of eternal life, then you need to call on Him and put your trust in Him. And I'd like us to bow our heads right now, if you would please. Just bow your head where you are and close your eyes, just between you and God right now. If you're here this morning and you've never called on Jesus, and you've never ever trusted Him alone as your Savior to forgive your sin, to receive the gift of eternal life, that you never put your faith in Him. I want to give you an opportunity to call on Him this morning. I'd like to help you word a prayer to God. Now I want you to understand something with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Just, just you and God right now. Just saying the words with me won't mean anything. God is not just listening to your words. God is looking at your heart. And he's looking at the sincerity of your heart this morning. And if you're here this morning and maybe for the first time you clearly understand how to receive God's gift of eternal life, then maybe you'd call on the Lord Jesus and you would pray something like this. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. And I now trust you, Jesus, and you alone as my Savior to give me the gift of eternal life and one day take me to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Please help me to live for you. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. No one's looking right now. This is just between you and God. You're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I, I just from my heart called on Jesus and I asked Him to be my Savior. Then I want you to slip your hand up right now so I can see it. Would you do that this morning? Would you just slip it up so I could see it? Thank you. Hold it up till I see it, would you please? There, that one, that one, three, four, five, six. Somebody else? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Others? I got ten so far. Others will join these. God bless you. You may put them down. Here's anyone else say, Pastor, before you before you pray and close the invitation, I want you to know I asked Jesus to be my Savior this morning as well. Would you slip your hand up that I could see it? Is there anyone else that I might not have included? Anybody else? I wonder if you're here today and would say, Pastor, I'm saved, but I've never been scripturally baptized. I didn't understand what baptism really was all about. But the Lord has spoken to my heart about baptism this morning. 
and, and pray for me, Pastor. I know that I need to be obedient and I need to follow the Lord in baptism. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. God bless you. God bless you and you and you and you. You over here, you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Wonderful. Now in a moment, I'm going to finish praying. When I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you slipped your hand up this morning and you said, I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior, then I want you to come down, meet me here at the front, shake my hand, and let us write your name on a card that you can, you don't have to say anything. We're just going to get your information. I'll tell the folks that you've received Christ as your Savior. Jesus said, whosoever believes on me should not be ashamed. So don't be ashamed of your decision. If you're here today and God has spoken to your heart about being baptized, we have everything you need to obey the Lord in baptism. We go downstairs. We have changing rooms. We have a robe you put on. You get baptized. We, you can dry it off with a towel, a blow dryer. Put your clothes back on and you can be obedient to God this morning. There's no, uh, you may have a, listen, you may have a better time. You, you may have another time, but you will never have a better time to obey God than you will right now this morning. If God has spoken to your heart today and if you've received Christ, and as soon as I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. When we stand to our feet, the pianist will begin to play. As she begins to play, Bob will sing an invitation hymn. You just slip from your aisle. People let you out. Just slip out in the aisle. Come right down here to the front. Meet me. We'll have someone take your name and say that. And I'll tell the people you've received Jesus as your Savior today. If you want to follow the Lord in baptism, say, hey, I want to follow the Lord in baptism. And we'll take care of that today as well. Why don't you make it a day for God's glory. And a day you'll never forget. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Thank you for these who've said they've received Christ as their Savior. And I pray, Lord, you'd help them not to be ashamed of that. But Lord, they'd be willing to, to come and let me tell the folks that they have received Jesus as their Savior. I pray for these this morning who lifted their hand up and said, yes, they know Christ but they've not been scripturally baptized. That they would come this morning and say, you know, I need to take that step of obedience and I need to be baptized today. I'm asking you, Lord, have your way in each heart that every individual will do exactly what you're telling them to do. And they'll respond to you this morning. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. Lord has spoken to your heart. You come and you, you tell me you receive Christ. Will you please? That's right. That's right. than snow, Lord, surely as I, as in thy presence, humbly I bow, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Spirit, till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. 
after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. If you're in the congregation, you can be seated. We're still getting names of folks up here who received Christ as their Savior. Isn't that good? And uh, that's what it's all about. Amen. You keep playing, Lisa. Don't stop. Thank you.
All right. Let's get from I read your name. I want you to stand up for us. And uh, this is the uh, first one I have here is Angel Crabtree. Angel's right here. Angel has received Christ as her Savior. And uh, she's going to follow the Lord in baptism this morning. Um, Angel, Mrs. Taylor, if you follow her right here, she'll take you downstairs and begin to get you prepared for baptism. We're, then we're glad to have Laura Weimer. Is that right? Laura, right here. Laura is, 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 is saved, and she wants to follow the Lord in baptism this morning. Praise the Lord, Laura. That's great. You come right this way as well, Laura. And then we also have Madison Wise. Is that right? Madison right here. Oh, Madison is getting permission right now. Madison's 13. And uh, so we, we don't baptize children. Uh, under 18 unless they have mom and dad's permission to be baptized so we'll be talking to her mom about permission for her to be baptized Madison congratulations that's great all right good and then we have Courtney Yoder is that Yoder hey great Courtney and uh, Courtney has accepted Christ as her savior and she's following the Lord in baptism this morning as well God bless you Courtney that's great you can follow right down there yeah if you'll help her lady one of you ladies help her know the way there and then Sherry Hurt Sherry is right here. Sherry has received Christ as her Savior, and she's also going to follow the Lord in baptism this morning. Sherry, God bless you. Come right this way. Right across the front here, Diane will help you get across and get you to where you need to go. All right. Also receiving Christ as their Savior today is Connor Hams. Connor's right here. Amen. Congratulations, Connor, 11 years old. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. And then also Lakeisha Powell. Lakeisha's right here, and she's received Christ as her Savior as well today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's good. And then, oh, I got a couple, a couple more here. Uh, Elizabeth, is that you, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, is that Patrick? Okay, and you're going to follow the Lord in baptism today as well? God bless you, Lakeisha. That's great. Elizabeth, go right ahead. She'll help you get down there. All right, and then I have one other card here. Let's see. Well, I've got a couple others. Um, this says, I can't, is that Tamara Hill? Tamara. Where's Tamara? Right here. Oh, Tamara. Okay, I, I talked to you. Okay, that's good. Tamara is, has been saved and uh, just coming back to God a little bit from being away from him. Is that right? And uh, are you going to get baptized? Praise the Lord. That's great. Amen. Come right on, Tamara. That's great. Glad to hear it. Wonderful. All right. And uh, by the way, our church folks would like to know that Bob Myers is going to get baptized this morning. All right. And uh, Bob's been coming for quite a while. Bob has had several uh, back surgeries. He's got some real severe back problems that has hindered him from coming in and getting baptized. But uh, he made the step this morning, and uh, we're going to baptize him today. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord. And then we also have... Uh, two folks coming to rededicate their lives to Christ. And uh, one is Tisha Askew. Tisha, is that right? Is she here? There you are, right there, okay? Rededicating her life to the Lord Jesus. God bless you, Tisha. Praise the Lord. And also rededicating her life to the Lord is Phyllis Durkham. Phyllis is right here, okay? God bless you, Phyllis. Praise the Lord. All right, that's wonderful. All right, got everybody now? All right, we're going to go down and pray to baptize these folks, and then when we come up from baptism, we'll disperse the tickets, and uh, when we come up from the baptism, then um, uh, workers in the line, those of you who will be serving, then you can, you can slip out. Once I come up through the door, you can go out and get ready, uh, then we'll disperse tickets and have a word of prayer, and then we'll all go out and eat some lunch, okay? All right, so we'll go down and prepare to baptize. Brother Bob will take you up here, all right? That's exciting. Well, I'm going to have my sister come. Nikki, we're going to sing a song. She found out about three seconds ago. So. Purpose or plan when 
trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth. shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day, then peace came and tears fled away. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, He makes no mistakes. At the end of each path that I take, for when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now I can see, testing comes from above, God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in His care. Through purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and pure. Isn't that the truth? When we can go through some rough times, but if we can lean on Jesus Christ and know that uh, He is our Savior, He is our Lord, we can come through the other side as gold. I'd like to sing a song talking about our wonderful Savior. It's, uh, if you want to follow along, you can. 532 in your book. It's, uh, what a Savior. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. What a Savior. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior to save a poor lost soul like me. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail-scarred, His side was riven, He gave His life's blood for even me. This is Bob Myers. And Bob, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, 
I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death. This is Angel Crabtree, an angel upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of his death. This is Tamara Hill. Tamara, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death. This is Elizabeth Patrick. Elizabeth, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death.
This is Courtney Yoder. Courtney, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death, and raised in the likeness of Jesus' Sherry Hurt. And Sherry, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Jesus' death. And the servant said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Of her 